Congratulations to Thibault, and I'm very sorry that I can't be there today myself. Um, we had two restrictive travel rules, but uh, next time I hope I can visit Thibault and uh, pass on my congratulations uh, myself and also the congratulations from my people here in Bonn, in particular Nobody Vex and others. But uh, the title was actually chosen on, on purpose because I think it does not only apply to gravity tests with pulsars, but to Thibault himself. And there are so many contributions, seminal papers that we are the pulsar community are grateful for, and, and also me personally. And uh, as you will see in this talk, there are lots of contributions that uh, were really important. Uh, and then I have treasured them since I started working in Pulsars and I continue to do so. And the purpose of the talk is to give you both an idea about uh, what Thibault has contributed and also how we um, actually used uh, his insight. And of course, I have to start with this paper somehow because uh, um, this is one that appeared actually before the first binary pulsar was uh, properly published in the journal. This is the paper by uh, Thibault and uh, uh, Remo on uh, the geodetic possession of the Hals Taylor pulsar. And uh, I will come back to this paper. <laughs> I will come back to the paper, of course, uh, later in this talk. Um, <laughs> But uh, of course, there's also uh, the famous uh, DD timing model, uh, the, the Moore-Direl uh, timing model, which was really a very elegant way of uh, uh, not only solving the, uh, the equation of motions, but also to uh, basically describe the timing formula that we as observers uh, could use and uh, basically uh, use the theory independent parameters that were introduced as uh, uh, for testing our theories of gravity. And all modern timing formulas today actually derive basically uh, from, from this set of uh, timing uh, equations and model. Um, there is this famous, as we call it these days, DT92 paper, the Damour and Taylor paper, which is really the standard reference ever since because it is a wonderful description about the uh, post capillarian formalism and the way we basically just try to extract the physics uh, from the timing. And the nice thing about this paper is it's really complete. It has uh, already so many post capillarian parameters in it that uh, were not even measurable at the time uh, when uh, Thibault and Joe wrote this uh, paper. And there's also a compendium how you uh, test not only uh, general relativity, but also alternative theories of gravity. So as I said, it has been the standard reference ever since. And I think it's probably on everyone's desk uh, doing pulsar timing. Uh, speaking about alternative theories, I have to mention the paper that he uh, wrote with uh, Jill esposito Farese, And uh, they basically discovered uh, this effect of spontaneous scalarization which uh, really is uh, one argument why we need to do binary pulsar tests, because even if you do a uh, test in the solar system uh, close to a Newton star, uh, there can be uh, effects that you wouldn't necessarily be able to measure otherwise. And there is a whole series of, of papers by Tibor and, and Jill. And uh, again, we will, we, you will see some of these diagrams in later in this talk as well. Uh, Thibault and Jill were also, I think, one of the first to try to compare and, and see what the complementive power of uh, binary pulsar test and gravitational wave detector results uh, would be in the future. And I think I will show you in a, few, in, in, a, in a following slide that this is indeed, I think, what has happened uh, with now this beautiful gravitational wave results uh, uh, being observed also. Uh, and still going strong, I'm very happy and glad that Thibault is a co-author on, on this paper here, which is a summary of 18 years of pulsar observation of the double pulsar. And uh, we have benefited a lot from discussions with Thibault. And, uh, and so a lot of the things that we had uh, sort of discussed over the years have now sort of found their way into this publication, which is a basically accepted. We're just waiting for the journal to, uh, to approve the revised version. And, and, and so I will use this uh, results basically as showing some of the um, things that uh, were 
um, put forward in the last 50 years and, and show you what the current state of art is. And by doing this, we'll come across a few more papers by Thibault. Um, but let's see, just look at the, what the experiment does. And of course, you know, we're looking at pulsars. These are rotating uh, cosmic lighthouses. They send us a pulse and whenever the pulse uh, the B radio beam is pointed towards us. We see a pulse once per rotation typically, and this is a rather comp uh, a precise clock, and we attach it here to the Newton star, hand a compact massive object. And if you put the whole thing in a binary system, all we do is watching uh, to see how this clock uh, falls in the curved space-time around the common center of mass with its companion. And we measure the times of arrival here on Earth They may be affected by the interstellar medium. But if you observe multiple frequencies and you time very precisely, you're basically able to um, test uh, uh, how, how the different theories um, basically predict this fall to happen. And that's exactly what we do. And of course, the first time that it was possible uh, was uh, with the Hulse Taylor pulsar, as I already mentioned, discovered in 1974. The paper came out in 1975. And I think uh, here's the beautiful uh, parabola plot in the latest version that is published by Joel Weisberg, who, of course, also contributed enormously to exploitation of the system. And um, the system already showed that gravitational waves exist. Uh, it showed that the energy uh, loss is as predicted as by GR. It showed that the gravity propagates with the speed of light. It uh, certainly also showed that GR holds for strongly self-gravitating bodies. And it was, of course, a forecast of what happened that W Newton star mergers uh, would exist and therefore was a good motivation to build gravitational wave detectors. So that's how it all started. And um, the, the formalism that was put, was put in place really, uh, really neatly uh, put forward by the DD timing model and summarized in the DD92 paper. Uh, basically, the idea is, of course, that you have observationals here with, uh, shown on, on the left-hand side of each equations, and they depend basically on the Keplerian parameters and the two unknown masses of the system. So the idea is, of course, if you measure uh, at least two of these equations, you can determine the masses. So you have two unknowns and two equations. But if you uh, measure more of these relativistic effects, uh, then you have overdetermined your, uh, your system and you uh, can do n minus two independent tests if you have measured n parameters. There's a beautiful way, of course, to show this in a graphical way. This is in this mass mass plot where each of these observables produces a curve that depends on the masses. And if the system is described properly by the theoretical, um, by the theory that you assume, they all intersect in a single point, which is the unique uh, pair of masses that describes the system. If you have a theory where these curves fail to intersect in a single point, then obviously the theory is falsified and should be rejected. And this is, of course, the mass mass diagram for the house Taylor pulsar. And here's another paper by Thibault and Joe that I would like to mention because in this paper in 91, um, they were really putting together all the possible effects that could uh, affect uh, the observed uh, um, orbital uh, period decay. And, um, and without that correction in particular here for the relative motion of the system to, to Earth, the curves wouldn't actually intersect, and uh, you would uh, pretend you had, would assume that you have falsified GR. But of course, with the proper correction, the curves all intersect in a single point, and that uh, led to confirmation um, of uh, the period decay. Um, of course, the idea that uh, external effects also play a role have been put forward in various effects by other people like Blandford and Wagner in the past. But I think this paper here was really a nice compilation of all the different effects that it can, could indeed affect the observed value. By now, we have a system that is superior to the Hulse Taylor pulsar. It's the, uh, also a famous, I think, the by now double pulsar system. We discovered that in 2003. We have two active pulsars orbiting each other in just 147 minutes. We have a recycled pulsar, which is spinning fast, and a young pulsar, which is spinning slow. Uh, orbital velocity is about 300 kilometers per second. And we see it from edge on, as you will see now, hopefully, in this animation. The tilt of the orbit against our line of sight is just 0.65 degrees. So it's really, really close to edge on. And that leads to eclipses. And it's a beautiful system to test uh, GR. And you see 
um, or any other theory of gravity, um, and you see the effects that we have measured in the system that I will uh, briefly mention in passing at all of them uh, in, on the next slides. Uh, we have now, as I said, uh, put out a publication, or it's about to be published, uh, of uh, all observations and we discovered the pulsar. We have precision astrometry, including a parallax and hence a distance measurement, which is, as you've seen for the Hastella pulsar, is very important. And so we determined the distance to 735 plus minus 60 parsec, which is pretty good. And uh, the transverse velocity is also very small. It essentially stands still uh, where, where it was born. Um, at the moment, we have about 1 million TOAs, so times of arrival measurements, and uh, we measure the post coplarian parameters very precisely. The most precise post coplarian parameter is actually the uh, periastron advance, and uh, we have measured as a level which is uh, exceeding the expected 2pn contribution by 35 sigma. So, and that will become important as you will see when we try to measure the moment of inertia of the Newton star. Um, of course, we do measure the orbital period decay, and here you see uh, sort of the, the parabola for the double pulsar. It's nicely sampled. The pulsars um, approach each other by about uh, seven millimeter a day, or the orbit shrinks by 107,820 plus minus seven picoseconds. And the, the, the expectation from GR compared to the observation is in agreement at a level of 1.3 times 10 to the minus four. This is the most precise test of the GR quadrupole formula that exists right now. And our precision is actually so large that we have to take the mass loss of the rotational spin down into account. As the pulsar spins down by emitting gravitational, and uh, sorry, uh, electromagnetic waves, uh, it's, uh, the, the period changes and uh, that loss in, in, in uh, energy uh, is to be taken into account and this is about 8.4 million tons per second. But on the other hand, it's only 3.2 times 10 to the minus 21 of the mass of pulsar A. This parabola, I think, is also, I think, uh, very nicely related to Thibault's work because, for instance, his 93 paper, uh, he showed that the uh, quadruple formula that is here is the one from his paper um, actually uh, is also valid for strong self-gravitating bodies. And I think that's important, and this parabola nicely shows that it is indeed the case. Um, we also measure light propagation, something that not many uh, experiments uh, can do in strong field. And uh, here, of course, we make use of the orbital inclination angle being so close to 90 degrees. Uh, the, which means that the light uh, has to pass the other Newton star in just 10,600 kilometer distance. And that leads to a delay in the arrival times because it has to propagate through the curved space time. And here again, you see the red curve is prediction by GR and the blue dots are our measurements. And again, uh, that allows us to actually determine the inclination angle of the orbit to that precision. And again, if you compare the observed value with the expectation from GR, again, there's an excellent agreement between the prediction and our experiment. If you actually be look a bit closer and uh, I sort of if you subtract the, uh, the, the, uh, the curve, and I've done it here again, so if you subtract the prediction in its simplest form, you actually saw a deviation, a clear signature. And that signature comes actually from two effects. It's actually the here we have to take the high, next higher order a Shapiro delay a contribution into account, which basically means that our lens pulsar B is moving by the time the photon has left A and reaches pulsar B uh, at its part of the orbit. And that leads to a shift uh, in the Shapiro delay curve. But it is only one contribution. The other contribution is actually um, a light bending because uh, the space time is curved. And so the, the pulsar A has to shoot its uh, photons slightly earlier before superior conjunction, uh, sorry, slightly later uh, um, before superior conjunction, slightly earlier uh, afterwards. And that leads to this nice signature here. So this curve actually also tells you the direction of spin of pulsar A relative to the orbital momentum vector. So and we can tell you it's, it's prograde. And, uh, and actually that, that bending here makes this 600 kilometers of the 10,600 kilometer distance uh, that the signal passes here. 
And uh, these uh, higher order effects are indeed consistent what we would have expected from uh, the theory, which is shown here by the red curve. So if you compare this, as, as I said, to other gravitational uh, experiments, which test light propagation, of course, we uh, have our image of the black hole. Uh, here is the Shapir, is the Shapir delayed test of, of the double pulsar. And in this diagram, where we plot the maximum curvature versus the potential, it is actually um, quite close to what the gravitational wave detectors can probe. And here is, of course, the nice, precise Cassini result of the solar system. We also have measured um, that the, uh, the orbit is relativistically deformed. That is because we have actually three eccentricities when we write down the equations of motion. And here is a very much exaggerated effect of, of how that uh, impacts on the orbit. And um, even though this effect is not measured with high significance, it's actually uh, important to include this in our timing model, because otherwise uh, we would have obtained a wrong uh, parameter of the Einstein delay and would have been uh, offset from GR by about two sigma. But by taking the orbital deformation into account, as it was uh, first uh, put forward by uh, the Monderel in the, in the 85 paper, we can actually show um, that is very much consistent with the prediction of general relativity. Um, I uh, should mention lens tiering effect. If I, I hear of, uh, via Gerhard, I think there was an interesting race going on in 87 to publish uh, the, the, the fact that the contribution uh, or uh, there's a contribution of lens tiering effects spin over coupling to uh, your observed uh, orbital pair precession uh, value. And in fact, so that's that's uh, written here, and it's written such to indicate that the contribution of dense tearing is actually of the same order of magnitude as the 2pn effect. As I mentioned before, we have measured this with the, uh, with the precision that exceeds the 2pn effect by 35 sigma. So there's in principle a chance to isolate that uh, contribution from dense tearing and hence uh, measure it. And this is the paper. I was very proud that we discovered this paper in original PDF format um, on, on uh, the other day preparing this talk. Um, this is in the, uh, I think, uh, report of the Academy of Science. And here's the uh, Nova Cemento uh, paper that came a little later. Um, so yes, we, we see this effect actually because um, here is a zoom into the mass mass diagram that I'll show you on the next slide in full. And this shift here between uh, the two omega uh, dot lines is the shift that if you take lens tearing account uh, or not. So there's a significant um, uh, deviation if you don't take it into account. By marginalizing over a um, different possible uh, equation of state, we can determine the mass of the two pulsars very precisely. And in fact, we can then also try to put limits on the moment of inertia um, that uh, we basically obtain. This is a diagram that we basically is a probability density function of our measurements. And at the moment, we can only give you an upper limit on the Newton star radius is 22 kilometers. Of course, it's not uh, competitive in that sense with, for instance, the nicer results. But as you can see, we start just basically from pulsar timing, start to constrain the radius of the Newton star which I think is a very nice result. And if you follow the paper by Hu et al, we show you how this will improve quite dramatically in the near future. This is the mass mass diagram for the double pulsar after this 18 years of observations. Each line is actually the thickness uh, or supposed to be the thickness of the uncertainty. And as you can see, most of them are much, uh, very precise. Now we have now seven core post parameters. We have this next to leading order effects in the signal propagation. We have the most precise test of GR using uh, the quadrupole formula. And um, we have started probing a moment of motion the equation of states. And uh, I think it's very cool. We, we need to take the mass loss into account as the pulsar spins down. And we already have started to observe this pulsar with the NECA telescope. I show some quick results in one of the next slides. Uh, and there, there the timing improves already by a factor of two to three or what we have achieved so far. Yeah, but let's talk about spin precession very, very briefly. Of course, it was this insight by Remo and Thibo that uh, the, uh, if the spin axis of the pulsar is misaligned with the orbital momentum vector, this will lead to precession of the pulsar. 
uh, around that uh, total angular momentum vector, and that changes the line of sight that we see uh, that we cut the, the radio beam with, and that leads to profile changes. And indeed, uh, as we have seen in the past, the Hulse Taylor pulsar is becoming narrower and narrower, and in principle should disappear around 2025, but maybe it just does another turn. We'll see uh, how the geometry evolves. We're working on an update on this paper. Uh, we have seen this effect also in a double pulsar. Uh, there's this beautiful work by René Breton, where we have used the eclipses of the pulsar uh, that changes with time because this eclipse is not uh, complete. It's actually because this is a donut rather than a sphere. This eclipse pattern is modulated. And uh, this, uh, mo this modulation pattern depends very sensitively on the orientation of the spin axis of pulsar B. And if pulsar B, as pulsar B processes, that uh, pattern changes and by tracking that change we can measure the change of the uh, uh, measure the precession rate and that's we validated that with the GR prediction with a precision of 13 uh, percent. Just as I've mentioned we already have Mikat observations and so this is a beautiful eclipse pattern uh, that we see with Mikat with all some sensitivity and uh, we started to uh, continue that uh, eclipse pattern matching and this is still preliminary work, but we can already expect that the precision of that test will probably be improved by, uh, improved by an order of magnitude or so. And this is a work in, in, in progress by Marcus Lower, who's just doing finishing his PhD at Swinburne University. Um, maybe the most beautiful test of geodetic precession is actually that will be published in 2019 using another relativistic binary pulsar. Um, which where we actually see the young Newton star, the double Newton star system. Here we see this beautiful um, two components in the pulse profile, which comes actually from the two opposite poles. And we can measure in particular the polarization of uh, characteristics of this uh, radio emission very precisely. And there's the, what they call the rotating vector model, which associates this position angle swing uh, with basically a projection of this feed line direction onto a line of sight. And hence, uh, as the line of sight changes, that slope in that uh, position angle uh, um, curve is a function of time. And we have tracked this pulsar also for more than 12 years. And here we show you the, the change in the position angle on one of the poles. And as the pulse actually crosses the magnetic pole, the sense of uh, the slope changes, swaps from positive to negative to positive. And that is exactly what the rotating model had predicted. And at the same time, that allows us to measure the precession rate. And again, we can measure this uh, here in this case uh, to 2.17 plus minus 1.11 degrees per year, which again is very nicely consistent with the prediction of GR. So I think that is actually the most beautiful uh, test of geodetic precession as it was predicted by uh, t and Remo in 1974. Let me say a few words before I finish about alternative theories of gravity or testing principles. There's of course, we already mentioned, heard about this on Tuesday, the microscope satellite that Tibor was involved with. Um, and uh, there's a beautiful, very uh, tight limit on the violation of the University of Free Fall. Um, there is, of course, uh, you can do lunar laser ranging or similar experiments uh, with the moon. And the question is, of course, uh, what can you do with binary pulsars? And there's one paper that Gerhard and Tibor wrote together, which basically showed the way how to do this. Um, they basically pointed out that a deviation from a, accent, uh, from a zero eccentricity orbit could be a violation of uh, at the University of Free Fall, if you have a, a white dwarf and a pulsar falling together in a galactic potential. And indeed, we've used that in the past to, uh, to um, produce uh, very nice limits. But nature has been even more kind to us than that because they have uh, given us the, the triple system, which is actually a pulsar with in orbit by, by two uh, white dwarfs. There's an inner uh, orbit with a pulsar and a, and a white dwarf, which is about 1.6 days. And there's an outer white dwarf, which always uh, the pulsar, inner white pulsar white dwarf um, system with a period of about a year. And um, together, uh, we basically can, can uh, track how the the white dwarf and the Newton star of the inner orbit fall in the gravitational potential of the outer white dwarf. And by doing this experiment, Archibald Adal produced that limit 
on the uh, violation of the University of Free Form, or uh, we used the strong field nowhere parameter that was introduced by um, uh, Thibault and, and, and Gerhard in, in the 91 paper. And uh, in, fa in fact, uh, we have improved on this limit uh, in, in both in quantitatively slightly, but in particular in, in, in cleanness, uh, cleanliness of the, of, of the test in a paper where we use beautiful Nancy observatory data uh, by Guillaume Bisson and, 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 and in collaboration with us. And that is a beautiful clean limit. And uh, it's, it's also beautiful work that Guillaume has been doing. Um, we could, of course, uh, put this then curve this also in, in a, in a uh, plot that were introduced by uh, uh, Thibault and Jill uh, to testing the, uh, what we nowadays call the Demur Esposito Farese gravity. Um, so you have these two parameters, alpha naught and beta naught, which are the coupling to, uh, to the scalar field linearly and, and quadratically. And everything below a line is uh, still allowed. Everything above a line is forbidden. And of course, the R's at the bottom minus infinity here. And uh, the triple system, in fact, gives you the best constraint for most of the parameter space. Um, but even the double pulsar here actually has uh, something to say about this, in particular about negative beta. And in fact, uh, if you take our timing data that I presented you earlier and you look at the sort of the theory realiza realization of this star here, you see that the uh, resulting a mass mass plot in, in fact, it looks like uh, many lines that do not intersect. And so this is indeed falsified as it is also beyond that curve here. Um, there are so many things I could uh, mention, what else you can do with binary pulsars. And I, I just leave that list on here. Let me just uh, point out to that paper by uh, Thibault and, and Jill testing the local Lorentz invariance. And there's a nice update by Li Jing Xiao and Norbert Wex from 2016. But again, the idea, uh, one of the ideas was uh, produced first by Thibault and his collaborators, in this case, Jill. And so, yeah, if you're interested in, in, in getting an update of what the current numbers are, that uh, there are two reviews, one by Norbert and Li Jing, one by Norbert and myself. So I can, I can recommend this. Let me finish basically by, by saying that um, I, I think it's a pity that Einstein didn't live to see the discovery of pulsars and, and, and the usage of, of how we uh, deal with them to test relativistic gravity. Um, because it's nice because they provide very precise, sometimes the most precise tests and often unique tests uh, for self, strongly self-gravitating bodies. Um, because of the nature of the experiment, the measurements are usually clean and precise. And so far, we haven't the fault, found the fault in, in general relativity, uh, which means we have tight constraints on, on alternative theories of gravity, which need to pass the binary pulsar test. Uh, I think I've showed you that we have done some very significant progress, in particular the double pulse and triple system, basically building this on, 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 on the work that he and collaborators have done. It's beautiful to see that we have now, I think, to send it to the next level of precision. We measure effects that were not uh, possible to measure uh, many years before. Um, we find more systems, and with the SKA coming online or Meerkat already and fast, uh, we are actually do find currently some very interesting binary systems, which may maybe eventually surpass the double pulsar as the double pulsar has surpassed the, the Taylor pulsar. And I just want to point out again that Thibault has really helped enormously to exploit these uh, binary pulsars with all the various works that he has contributed. And yes, I think uh, we are still going strong and with Thibault's help, then uh, there are many more years to come to do even more. And my final slide is, um, I, this is my, I mean, there are good, very many quotes from Einstein, but as a pulsar astronomer, astronomer I like this uh, quote, um, very nice, uh, very nice, um, very much because it, he says, is, I just did my, my English translation, that comes the pedantic precision of astronomy to the rescue, which I've ridiculed silently so often in the past. And he wrote this in a letter to Arnold Sommerfeld um, after he was able to explain the Merc Mercury perihelion advance with this field equation. And I like this, um, this uh, uh, picture animated image of, of Einstein. I think it's very cool. Anyway, I, I, I couldn't help to add this, uh, this nice plot from a um, picture from um, T-Board's um, comic um, on the quantum world, which I also have at home and uh, really much like. 
So um, with that, uh, thanks, Thibaut. And uh, I've heard you, we shouldn't praise it too much, but I'll do it anyway. So thank you very much in, in terms of um, helping us with our um, uh, observations and trying to understand them. Thank you very much. Are there other questions, short questions, <coughs> comments? Hello, please, yeah. So concerning the test of the strong equivalence principle with the triple pulsar, <coughs> you give the value uh, or the maximal value of this combination delta, which involves the gravitational energy divided by the mass. But what about in terms of the uh, uh, Nordvet parameter in front? And how does it compare with the lunar laser ranging test? Yeah, so it's certainly it's not. There's some echo. Um, it's not as precise as 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 the lunar laser ranging um, was getting there. It's certainly not as precise as the microscope experiment. But the order of magnitude, I think I have to I have to go back to my slide to actually check. But I think we're about an order of magnitude worse than the lunar laser ranging. Um, no, it's ten to the minus thirteen. So not quite there yet. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a strong field effect uh, the measurement, at least in our case. So that's why it's important. So, so in, you know, in, in measure of eta, epsilon is, is 10% and the result is yes. that is 106. So it is more precise. Yes, but uh, yeah, in terms of case, eta only, that's my question. What is the test? I you cannot case? because it is all the effect. Yes. So that's why it's. But if we have a violation of the. Equivalent principle, there should be the same eta in principle in different bodies. Yes. So eta is a good measure to compare tests uh, on different regimes and for different systems. But you want to be theory independent, so you cannot be. Yeah. Okay. Is there another question? But in terms of in terms of eta, I mean epsilon is a 0.04 percent. And in terms of the triple system was 0.002%. In this case, it's indeed more precise as uh, Thibaut just you know, in absolute terms, of course, it's not. But thanks, Thibaut, for making that argument. <laughs> okay. A very naive question, Michael. Uh, you've seen double system, triple systems. What about more complex uh, <laughs> you know, pulsar system? Is this likely to occur or, or very unlikely? Or? There are planets. We have planets. Yeah. I was just about to say we have uh, yes. one planetary system with three planets at least. Um, but yeah, they're not very good for testing gravity because the planets themselves have not very large mass. Um, anything more massive than that, I think, wouldn't be stable enough to survive long enough for our observations. It also becomes a little bit messy. So uh, even the triple system doing the uh, theoretical analysis properly uh, was a challenge, and I think that's the beauty about what Jom has uh, Jom has shown in, in in his paper, which I think is much more elegant what we have done than than what an Archibald and others have done. Um, but I'm biased then. Okay, so let us thank Michael again. Thank you very much.